This is Wayne Dyer. I'd like to share with you a powerful secret. One that has the ability to transform your life in ways that you probably can't even begin to imagine. You have the innate power to attract to yourself anything you want in life. This is a very strange yet a powerful idea. You, you have the power to attract to yourself anything you want in life. This power lies deep within the recesses of your soul and is only accessible through the workings of your highest self. In this program, I'll lead you on a journey to this mysterious territory, and I'm going to reveal ancient spiritual teachings that will help guide you to the truth of your own divinity and begin to reveal the secrets to manifesting anything you desire. From remarkable stories of prosperity and healing that bordered on miracles, thousands of people all over the world have already experienced amazing feats of manifesting in their lives. And you can too. With Dr. Wayne Dyer's Secrets to Manifesting Your Destiny. In this live seminar recording, Dr. Dyer will explore the mysterious workings of your highest self and reveal the nine spiritual principles that hold the key to your true destiny. Nightingale Conant is pleased to invite you to enter a dimension of limitlessness, where the power of the universe is there for the taking, where you will discover limitless riches and abundant happiness, a place that will change the way you think about life forever. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The subject matter of uh, this presentation is in areas that I must admit that I've had some concern about my own ability to write and speak about these things. There's more doubt in me as I prepared to write about this and to speak about this than I really like to admit to. I have written books about banishing doubt, about having faith, about having confidence in yourself, and so on. And it seems to me that you get to a point in your life where all that you've done up until this point is sort of preliminary to something grander and something greater, and you're almost afraid of what that thing might be. And I don't think it matters what age you are. I think there comes a moment when you recognize in yourself that now I've got to take a leap. I've been safe. I've been in uh, territory that I'm familiar with and that is easy for me. And now I want to uh, take that leap of faith, but I don't know if I can do it. I always like the uh, metaphor of uh, standing on a cliff and down below is an abyss and this abyss is endless and I think uh, of our lives as like we're standing there and we know that this is all unknown territory and it's like we jump perhaps but when we jump there's like a rock that goes with us and we hang on to this rock and we're grabbing it and holding on to it and we're falling and we're being carried someplace that we're not quite sure where we're headed, which is sort of what our life is like. And we just hang on to this thing, this rock, whatever it might be, our reality, if you will, or our past, and we cling to it and we cling to it and we cling to it so strongly because we're afraid if we let go, who knows what could happen. And then there comes a moment or a time when you realize this thing isn't doing you any good. This thing that is your past, this thing that is all your teachings, this thing is that you're so familiar with that you don't want to let go of it, but you're not quite sure why you're hanging on to it. And then there comes a moment when you realize, hey, I can let go of this thing, and it doesn't really change anything. 
that's sort of the way I feel about entering into this whole territory of being able to manifest. And when I talk about manifesting, I'm really talking about the ability to take what it is that we think about that's in the world of our thoughts and to be able to have the power to bring that into the world of our daily experience called the physical world, whatever that might be. Now, when I started thinking about, after I had completed uh, Real Magic and uh, Your Sacred Self and all of the programs that uh, are around those themes, a lot of people would write to me uh, who had listened to these programs, who had read my books, and would say, what's the next step for you? You know, what can you do after this? I can't imagine that you could write anything any more than this, I've heard people tell me, or you could say any more. And always at the back of my mind was this idea that there is something missing in all of the literature that really doesn't deal efficiently and effectively with this, um, this ability to attract to us and to have show up for us in our lives uh, what it is that we would like somehow we've come to believe that that's outside of our control. That whatever shows up, whatever happens to us, whatever the breaks are, whatever those, those things are all sort of in the realm of coincidences. And, uh, and they happen uh, if God wants them to happen for us or if, uh, if they're so predestined or ordained. And that we don't have that kind of power to be able to do that. That's reserved, if you will. And it's reserved for deities or people who have special dispensation from God or holy people or lucky people. But it doesn't really involve me. I grew up with that attitude, just like so many of the rest of us. But at the, always at the back of my mind, I felt that there are some people who have the ability to get outside of that mentality. And there are some people that just attract things to themselves and they seem to show up and uh, uh, we just call them lucky. But they're not. There are certain qualities, there are certain behaviors, there are certain attitudes that people have that we've never really made a science out of, okay? We've never really studied in depth. And I thought to myself, I'm going to talk about manifesting. Many of you listening many of you here today with me know that my work has really shifted. It's shifted from teaching people how to manage their emotions and teaching people how to um, avoid being victims in their lives and to have psychological strength and how to raise children like this and all of these things that I've... And, and then there's been a shift and in the last 10 or 15 years the shift moved away from matters physical and into matters metaphysical, beyond the physical. And then my work took on like this real sort of spiritual tone. And God became a very important part of my life and my work when it, this wasn't so in my earlier work. In fact, if you look through uh, books that I wrote 20, 25 years ago, you won't even see references to the word spiritual or to the word God. And if you look at more recent things. And people ask me about that. You know. And I say, you know, it's just as intriguing to me as it is to you. I don't know why either. But my writing seems to, and my, my programs, my work seems to reflect uh, a consciousness that I am going through. And it seems to reflect what the rest of the world is going through as well. That there is a shift, and I seem to be one of the spokespeople for that shift. When I started into this area and writing in this area, I immersed myself in spiritual literature. I read the Bhagavad Gita, the book that Gandhi based his life upon. It translates to the Song of the Lord. It's a book that you can read in one afternoon, 18 short chapters. But you can study it for a lifetime. You can read one little short paragraph from it each day and just try to practice it and see what it means. And I studied that almost every day. And even working guides to the Gita. And I immersed myself in A Course in Miracles, which is um, 
a whole collection of writings that uh, a lot of people aren't sure about what the origins are, and there's discussions about who did it, and is it really the work of Jesus Christ, and is it channeled work, and so on. But whatever it is, and whatever its origins, what I know is if the world were living by the principles that are in there, we could really solve virtually all of the problems that we face as a people. And it's really a whole text on how to create miracles and how to live at a loving, higher place in our lives. And I also immersed myself in Madame Blavatsky's work. And she wrote a book back in the 19th century called The Secret Doctrine. And in The Secret Doctrine, she made some predictions. And Madame Blavatsky was one of the people, she was the founder of the Theosophist movement and was very, very influential. Had met Gandhi herself when he was a very young man, influenced people like William Butler Yeats, and Jack London, and uh, many of the novelists, and so on. A woman from Russia who traveled all over the world and lived in India for a long time. And she wrote this fabulous uh, collection of, uh, of metaphysical works about what is possible for humanity. And one of the things that she predicted is that in the last quarter of the millennium, the last 25 years of the millennium, and into the year 2011, there would be ushered in an enormous spiritual revolution. And this revolution would transcend anything we had ever known before about revolutions, like the agricultural revolution and the uh, industrial revolution when the whole shift took place uh, away from agriculture and towards industry. And then the technological and, the, uh, and even the information revolution that we've seen in the last few years. And she said, when the spiritual revolution is ushered in, it will transcend all of the previous revolutions. And it will begin in the last 25 years of the millennium, which was the year I wrote your erroneous sounds. And she also said that the people who will be the leaders of this revolution will not be the people in power. And, you know, if you look at the changes that have taken place on the planet, in the last 20 years or so, since the beginning of the uh, last 25 years of the millennium, those changes are really astronomical. I mean, we've almost become blasé about them. But, I mean, the fall of Berlin Wall and the dismantling of apartheid and the dismantling of communism and the dictatorships that have been overthrown and uh, even the fact that you can't smoke on airplanes anymore. I mean, uh, <laughs> these are monumental changes and shifts uh, that have taken place. And, and, and really, the result of not so much people in power saying, let's not do this anymore, this isn't a nice way to treat people, but because of what Victor Hugo said in Les Miserables, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And when Madame Blavatsky talked about who the leaders of the spiritual revolution would be, she said that these leaders will be ordinary people, regular, everyday folks, school teachers, Musicians, artists, cab drivers, regular folks. And these people will speak out with a voice. And this voice will be heard. And then the bureaucracies will fall in line and begin to reflect what it is that this consciousness is instituting in our people. And if you look at the people who have been instrumental in changing consciousness in the last 25 years, you look at the people whose programs you listen to through Nightingale Conan and ask what are their backgrounds. You find out that they're salesmen. Marianne Williamson was a, uh, a singer, a nightclub singer. Louise Hay was a dancer. Dennis Whateley was a salesman. Zig Ziglar was a preacher. People who just did everyday, regular things. I was a school teacher. And somehow, there's a power, there's a pressure, there's something that has come and put us in a position of just talking about this kind of shift, this kind of consciousness. And what has happened for me, the little school teacher, is that when I...
finally immersed myself in the most spiritual text that I have really studied was the New Testament. I listened to the New Testament uh, when I was a little boy. And I lived in a series of foster homes when I was a child. And so uh, they would, wherever I would go, they would just sort of put me in whatever church group that particular home practiced. So I'd be a Baptist one year, and the next year I'd be a Methodist, the next year I'd be a Catholic, and I'd be a Jew the next year, whatever. Uh, and, you know, you think that this is some terrible thing, that you're not going to get any roots. But really what it did for me was it exposed me to all kinds of different ways and different approaches to uh, these truths. And then I sort of let that go because uh, there was a, uh, an element of imposing it and fear that I found myself uh, being exposed to. You know, to fear God was what you were supposed to do. Sort of. And so um, I let that go in my life for a long period of time. And then before I uh, began to write about these books uh, that sort of moved me away from psychological matters into spiritual matters, um, I really immersed myself in the New Testament. I read it from beginning to end, particularly the parts in red. Remember the parts in red? You know, <laughs> that, you know this is like, this is what other people were saying about what Jesus Christ was saying, and then this is what Jesus was saying. And it's like, this is in red, so, you know, you can remember that. And um, you'll hear me talking about this in this program a great deal, a lot of the things in red. Not because I am trying to proselytize for any particular religious point of view or I'm trying to recruit anybody or, you know, I'm not, I don't see myself in that role at all. It's not the purpose of what I'm talking about. But more to give us an understanding of what divine spiritual messages can mean for us in our life and how some of this has been misinterpreted as we have moved towards becoming more spiritual people. And so you'll hear me referring to this quite a bit. And then the, uh, one of the things that I read was this idea that, um, that Jesus Christ said to the masses, that something to the effect that even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things, that you have this power within you. And reading that and interpreting that literally means being able to produce miracles, doesn't it? And being able to make things uh, happen that we really th sort of think are reserved for other people. And so what has happened with most of us is that we have come to believe that there are spiritual beings that we have sort of deified, and then there's us, and that we are separate from that. And in our separation, we have sort of given the power of being able to do these divine kinds of things, like manifest. The gift of fish and loaves is the gift of uh, being able to feed the hungry from one's consciousness. The thought is enough to bring food into a place where there is a need for, uh, where there is starvation, where there is uh, hunger. And you think about, well, how can I, do I have the power within me is this what I'm being told? That I have the power within me to think food and then just wave a magic wand and there is food. Do I have that power? Well, according to, if you read that literature thoroughly and interpret it literally, yes, you do. But most of us find it very difficult to even begin to accept this idea that I can have a thought about something and with that thought, I can then shift it to having it materialize or manifest or show up in the physical world. But I'd like to suggest to you that that's the only way anything gets into the physical world. That manifesting is really nothing more than everything showing up in the physical world is the result of a divine idea. Everything, including you and everything that you have, and everything that you see, and everything that you observe, and everything that you notice. And that somehow we are being encouraged to disregard our old belief systems, that that is something that is reserved for others other than myself. And what I am going to do here in this program is talk about what I think 
are the principles that you need to master and in sequential order begin to practice on a daily basis. And if you do, I'm saying that I know that the ability to transfer from the world of your thoughts to the world of your physical reality is not only possible, but it is very, very likely that you will see it showing up if you practice these principles. And as I sat down to write these principles and organize myself to think about these principles, I said to myself, who am I to be able to do this? Who am I to even challenge myself in such a way? But you know, what happens is you get, I don't know if it happens with you, but it happens with me. Something sticks in your cross. It's something you start to think to yourself, yeah, you know, I'd really like to explore this area. I'd really like to talk about this. It's, it's way outside my area of expertise. But you know, you have to have the chutzpah or the, the, the courage or whatever it is that you want to call it to just say, all right, I'm going to do it anyway. So what I'm saying to you as you listen to this program, what I'm saying to all of you here today, is that you have to be very careful not to contaminate your experience of being able to become a manifester with your expectations of this is impossible. The contamination process is one which says, I can't do this. It's like I, have, I, I know already that this is something I can't do. And this is the very hardest thing for each and every one of us to grasp. It isn't like these nine principles are going to be very difficult. In fact, many of you, as you're listening to these, will say, well, I know this. Well, of course. And what's that got to do with manifesting? Well, by the time you finish this program, you will see exactly what each one of them has to do. And you'll have to be able to take each one and sequentially have it move to the next. And they're in a very specific order for a very specific reason. And when you stop the process of contamination with your expectations that I'm not expert enough, which is exactly what I did when I entered into this territory of saying, okay, there are divine people that I have read about that have this gift of manifestation, that live at this thing that we call Christ consciousness or Siddhi consciousness, which is a consciousness in which there is a thought and then there is no time lag between the thought and its manifestation into the physical world. There are people who live at this high level of awareness, of consciousness. And I've read about them, and all of them say that each and every one of us have that as well. What's going on here? If they can do it, and they're telling us that we can do it, then what do we have to do in order to be able to do that? And isn't that, doesn't that seem like to our rational sort of left brain that that might be a logical thing for us. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a poem. The poem is called The Cookie Thief. And it was written by Valerie Cox. The Cookie Thief. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled 
and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at that thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. <laughs> if mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. <laughs> Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. Isn't that great? <laughs> so how many times in your life have you absolutely known something? I mean, I have eight children, okay? I mean, I have been the cookie thief so many times, it's really hard for me to admit this on tape, all right? When you know that something is a certain way, and you're absolutely certain of it. I mean, I can remember just, you know, just recently telling, accusing three of my kids of hiding my keys. <laughs> I put them right here. This is where I left them. And don't tell me you didn't come and play with them. I've seen you do it before. Now, where are my keys? You've got to stop playing with my keys. I've told you before, when I'm in a hurry, I have to know where my keys are. I didn't do it, Daddy. Honest, I didn't do it. Honest, I was just playing. I didn't, I didn't touch your keys this time. Yeah, right. Where are my keys? And I go around accusing everybody in the house of taking my keys. Then I went back and looked in my jeans pocket. <laughs> there were my keys. <laughs> the cookie thief. But, you know, we've all done this where we've had a knowing about something and then uh, later on realize that, and of course, I'm usually, I don't want to, you know, it's very hard to admit. You know, go to each one of your little kids, especially if they're five and six, and say, you know, Daddy really is a jerk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. I was, you know, you just, I just sort of uh, pass, let that one pass over. I found my keys, you know. But it also applies in the kinds of things that I am talking about in this program. This idea of moving into territory that we know in our hearts and in our consciousness is not something that we can do. And we know it. And getting out of that mode of thinking and transcending that doubt and creating this knowing rather than a belief but a strong knowing within us is very, very significant and important in understanding this business of manifesting. It means really removing the contamination process from your life. That which has been told you over and over and over again that is not possible for you. And many of the ideas here are very radical and will be perceived by some as almost blasphemous and uh, perhaps entering into territory and giving people false hope and telling people that they can do things that they really can't do. But I know better. And when I practice manifesting, when I practice these techniques that I'll be sharing with you here, I see the results. And not only do I see them, but many of the people that I have talked to about this for the past couple of years now, and people, several thousand, perhaps a hundred thousand or so people, uh, have begun this practice of, of meditating and using these sound meditations that I'll be sharing with you here today. Things that have been held in high secrecy for centuries which are now beginning to be revealed. Thank you. idea was uh, one of those synchronistic uh, sort of serendipity kinds of things that uh, I have come to know are not accidental any longer, you know, that when you reach a level of consciousness that is uh, uh, 
beyond uh, just surviving and just living your life each day, you begin to realize that these things that show up in your life show up for a reason. And later on, I'll be explaining about how this particular person in India read one of my books. You'll see it when you believe it. Picked up the uh, telephone, called my office, sent me a uh, tape and asked me if I would listen to this tape and practice this meditation that is an ancient meditation that goes way back. If I would do this each day for 15 days without any doubt, just do it. Well, I'll do anything for 15 <laughs> days. <laughs> If they, I'll give it a shot. I'm always willing to give it a shot. I don't, I've never had, I've always believed sort of this, I've had this philosophy that goes way back, which is that no one knows enough to be a pessimist, you know, uh, and that the universe is too big and too expansive and there's too much out there that we can't even begin to grasp as these tiny little subatomic particles in this huge uh, universe, so that I'm willing, I've always had this sort of open mind, I'll try it, of course I'll try it, and uh, I tried it and and these phenomenal things began to start happening in my life. Things started showing up that I would put my attention on. And I would do this daily meditation using these sounds, these sounds of creation. And in the process of doing this, I thought it would show up in a certain way. Like if I put my attention on what it is that I want to manifest, and then I just start looking around for it to manifest like this, and I'm looking over here to the right. And I'm looking and saying, well, where is it? How come it's not here? And it's behind me on the left in a totally different form. Because one of the things that you'll hear is that you have to have patience. That you don't, you don't, you let the universe or God or whatever you want to call this divine organizing intelligence, you let that handle the details. But you just put your attention on having it show up in your life with a powerful knowing that it will. And then you let go. And you tune into this divine intelligence which is actually a part of you. Because if it's everywhere, that means there's no place that it's not, including you. But more on that later. And so, as I started doing this, I remember one great story. I practiced this meditation, and this meditation involves a sound, repeating this sound, the sound of God, uh, as Muktananda talked about, endlessly repeat his name over and over again with inwardly and outwardly, the sound, which is talked about in the later part of the program. And I had been doing it for 15 days. And I was up in my um, daughter's room, Sky, who is 15 years old. And she said, Dad, one of the light bulbs in the uh, light fixture, which also is a part of a fan above her bed, and it has four lights in it. She said, one of the light bulbs is out. Would you come up and change it? Now, my kids are usually very nervous about this sort of thing because I have already established myself as someone who can't do these kind of things. All right? <laughs> and if I do, horrible things are going to happen. Not because I don't have the talent, but because I have figured out if everybody believes I can't do this, they won't bug me about it. All right? <laughs> And so they, I, I love it when my kids laugh at me trying to fix something and then my wife calls a repairman and I, you know, everybody has these Native American names. You remember uh, the uh, Native American movie, uh, what, what, what was it, uh, Kevin Costner's movie? Yeah, Dances. Dances with Wolves. Everybody is named for what it is that they do in life. My name, my Indian name, my Native American name is He Writes the Checks. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, so I like that, by the way. That's the name I want to have, all right? I mean, I don't want to be cleaning up the garages and uh, fixing tables and, uh, you know, uh, trying to get the, uh, when the tire is flat. I get a new tire. That's fine. That's sort of the way I've uh, done that. All right? And I'm not saying that anyone else ought to do that, and I certainly know that I would be able to, if I wanted to, be Mr. Fix-It, but it's not the choice that I'm making at this time in my life. So I've really been very uh, adamant about getting a reputation for being totally incompetent in these areas. I, I like that reputation. And so she very gingerly asked me if I would change this light bulb because she couldn't reach it. And I said, sure, I can do that. Now, my wife never lets me do that because she knows if I, you know, I remember one time she said, pull the, uh, the uh, on the draperies in the bedroom, one of the hooks was uh, not uh, on, you know, and it just sort of come down. 
And she said, can you just get up there and put that hook on? And she said, well, close the drapes. I said, we can close the drapes. And I grabbed the drape and I pulled it, and the whole thing came crashing <laughs> down to the ground, which was great. It's just one of those things where I've never asked, to, I don't have to fix draperies now ever again in my life. <laughs> well, anyway. So I went up to her room and I said, this is something I can definitely do. I definitely can change a light bulb, all right? So I got up there and I started turning the light bulb. And I turned it and I turned it and I turned it and nothing was happening. It was just seemed to be getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, you know? And I just kept turning it and losing a little more force and I would turn it a little harder and a little harder. Eventually, I turned it and the whole thing snapped. And there I was holding <laughs> a piece of light bulb with sort of shattered glass and the uh, metal part was still up there in the socket. And there I am standing there and Sky said, I should have known, I should have known not to ask you to... I said, couldn't help it, I said, but I know how to fix this. I said, honey, go downstairs and get a pair of needle nose pliers and we'll get that socket, we'll reach up in there and we'll get it out of the socket. We'll get a hold of that little piece of metal and we'll turn it and then we can replace the light bulb. It's not a problem. So she went downstairs and she came back up. She said, there, we don't have any needle nose pliers. I said, here we go, the cookie thief. I said, oh, we have needle nose pliers. Don't tell me we don't have them. I know what they are and where they are. And I went down and of course I couldn't find them. So I let it go and I just said, we'll get a new fan. <laughs> <laughs> he writes the check, right? <laughs> So uh, the next morning I went out and I went running. Now I've been doing this meditation for 15 days, this meditation that's on this program. And as I finished the, uh, my morning meditation, I then went for a run. And I ran about uh, 12 or 13 miles, which I do almost every single day. Um, it's just something that I love to do early in the morning. And while I was running, I was thinking about those needle-nose pliers. And where would they be? And I would really like to fix that thing. And I don't like having those, that, that up there. There might be an electrical problem and so on. And uh, there could be a short in there or something. And I'd like to fix that. And as I came into, and it was even in my meditation, those needle-nose pliers kept coming into my meditation. And this sounds so strange, so weird. I pulled into the driveway after my run and after my meditation, and there, on the driveway, was a brand new pair of needle-nose pliers with yellow handles. Brand new! Which we had never had before. They were just on the driveway. So I picked them up, and I looked at them, and I went, you know, it's like when, you know when these things happen, you go, whoa, booga, <laughs> booga, 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 you know, like, what's going on here? Guruji, this teacher, this brilliant, enlightened, non, what I call non-dual being, I'll explain that later, had told me that if I practice this meditation, what will begin to start showing up in your life is that whatever you put your attention on will begin to show up. He said, it will happen. This is like the secret of manifesting. Even though you don't understand it and your rational left brain says, no, 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 no. You don't just think about something and have it happen. He is saying, this is exactly what will begin to happen. So I took those needle-nose pliers and I took them in and I showed them to my wife. I said, can you believe this? I and I called Sky down. I said, we do have needle-nose pliers. She said, we didn't have those before. I said, I know. I manifested them. You know, I was like <laughs> acting like really superior, right? So I went upstairs. I turned the electricity off, just in case you were thinking I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and got up there, twisted it off, got the light bulb play, and I, and I fixed something. All right? And we still have those needle-nose pliers. And I look at them. In fact, I set them right on my desk just to remind me that there's more to this than the word coincidence, at least in my estimation. All right? And so I was telling our friends, Bonnie and Jeff, that we were having dinner one night at this restaurant in Boca that had just opened. It's called the Cheesecake Factory. It's one of those places that serves you just monumental amounts of food, which seems to be what we're doing in America these days. You know, like they bring your salad out in a wheelbarrow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and free refills on, you know, 64-ounce drinks and, uh, you know, things like this. So uh, it's a wonderful place. But they had, like, these spotlights out front, and it was a grand opening, and my wife and I had been invited there 
to be, you know, at their, at their opening and so on. We were there, and we took Bonnie and Jeff with us. And I was telling them about this meditation that is the subject matter of this program. And Bonnie got really excited. She just went, oh, you've got to teach us how to do that. You've got to show me how to She's one of these people that whatever you're talking about, she's willing to try it. You know, if you're talking about reading aura, read my aura. I want to know about my aura, whatever it is. So she got all excited. And, and Jeff is the father of one of our children, Serena, best friend is, uh, is their daughter, Courtney. And so we see them a lot because her daughter's over at our house a lot. And Jeff is a builder. And been going through some fairly tough times in the building industry down in, in South Florida. This was a couple of years ago. And um, so as I was telling that, I, I said, well, I can't teach it to you now because uh, it involves sound. I mean, you have to make noise. And, you know, there's thousands of people or hundreds of people anyway, and there's reporters, and they all know who I am. And I said, I can't be doing this here in the restaurant. And Bonnie said, why not? <laughs> what do you mean? You talk on your programs about not worrying about what other people think. Why are you worried about what they think here? You know? I'll tell you, when you're a guru, it's really tough, right? You know? You've got to watch yourself at every moment. So I said, well, you know, it's just like, it's going to look a little weird. She said, so what if it looks weird? I want to learn it. She said, we're going away. We're going away tomorrow. And Courtney was staying with us, so I knew they were going away. She said, we're going to Las Vegas. Uh, we're in a slot machine tournament. And I want to learn this before we go. <laughs> I said, a what? She said, a slot machine tournament. I said, I've never heard of a slot machine tournament. She said, yeah, people from all over the country just sign up. They come to Las Vegas. There's 700 of them or so. They assign you to a machine, and then everybody plays the machine for Friday night, all day Saturday, and until Sunday afternoon. And then at the end of the, uh, they tabulate, and they have the winners, and they give them, you know, they, it's all kept uh, track of electronically and so on. She said, I want to learn how to manifest before I go there. I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know if you can use it this way. I don't, <laughs> something about spirituality in Las Vegas, it just, uh, <laughs> It didn't seem to have the right mix, you know. But I said, why not? You know, I mean, it's like abundance is abundance. I mean, uh, why should we have any ad uh, judgments about, you know, it being uh, something right or wrong or whatever? So um, we started doing the meditation. I started explaining the whole meditation that I had been taught by Guruji, this great teacher. And um, we did it right there in the restaurant. We all, the four of us, and we started making these sounds, and everybody started looking at us, and what's going on over here in the corner? What's happened to Dyer? He's flipped out. Um, <laughs> but we did it, and I taught it to them. Well, they went away. Courtney stayed at our house. They went away on Friday. Jeff checks into the hotel in Las Vegas. He gets assigned to a machine, and he's in the lobby of the casino. And his wife is assigned to the machine next to him. Now, this is all done by computer. It's never happened to him before. They do this all the time. So it's like right away he's thinking, this is really strange. I got the machine. She's right next to me, and there were 700 people. How did this happen? So he wraps his legs <laughs> around this machine and proceeds to pull the levers and do this meditation at the same time for three days. He's going, ah, I'm going to and everybody would look, you know, in the casino, you've got to get a picture of this, you know. This is like a guru sitting at a slot machine doing the sound meditation <laughs> with an absolute total conviction that he could make something happen here. And they come back on Sunday afternoon, or they get back Sunday evening, and they come over to pick up Courtney, and Bonnie comes running in, you know. She's so excited. She said, we won, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was something like $27,000. <laughs> She said, and she said, do you think it has anything to do with this meditation? Do you, I mean, she said, we've never won anything doing this before. She, and Jeff comes in behind her, and he has just bought himself a brand new camera. You know, with the, one of these, and he's filming the whole thing, one of these uh, portable video cameras. And he puts his hand on his hip, and he says, just call me Jeff the Manifester. All right? <laughs> like Conan the uh, Barbarian, you know, he's Jeff the Manifester. He began practicing that meditation. And he put in a bid on building something like 200 homes that he received. He had never ever, this is a small building company. His income has like quadrupled. His building, uh, a number of employees have uh, like tripled. He's just, all kinds of these fabulous things of, uh, that he has been putting his attention on have begun to happen. I mean, 
What I'm saying here is I don't know that if you put your attention on just going to Las Vegas and, and having money come into you, that this is uh, like something for, uh, you know, everybody thinks, well, I'll just get greedy and I'll just have a whole lot of money. But there's something about abundance and having it show up in your life and your ability to put your attention on what it is that you would like to manifest. Yesterday, or a couple of days ago, in Lilydale, New York, where I had taught this manifesting technique a year ago, there were um, five or six people there who had been there the previous year. And each one of them came up on stage and talked about what they had done. One woman had manifested for herself a metaphysical bookstore, which she had always wanted to have. And she did it without having any money. She had no down payment, no nothing. She was now the owner of and running a profitable business in, I think, Silver Spring or something like that, uh, Maryland. Another woman uh, talked about her cancer being in remission after uh, practicing this meditation on a daily basis and putting her attention on healing and so on. Another, uh, a man came up uh, who had, was uh, 60, no, it was a woman, who came up who, was 60, who had lost 65 pounds in one year. But before, she had done this many times before, but she had never done it where she hadn't been able to keep it off for any length of time. And she said, I put my manifesting attention on keeping it off and not going back to my old addictive ways. And she said, now for one year I have been at this weight. These kinds of stories, I had another person tell me that they had been told, this couple, young couple had been told that they couldn't have a child that their wife, her name was Denise, had premature ovarian failure and uh, her uterus could not support a child and she had been given, they'd been told this, but yet they still, they began to practice this meditation. In fact, practicing it to such an extent that they, which is one of the things that I was taught, is that you have to act as if what you want is already here because it really is, because we're really not creating anything. We're just realigning ourselves. When you manifest, you're manifesting just another aspect of yourself, which I'll explain a little bit later so that it isn't like you don't take on this role of creator you take on this role of attracting to you that which already exists and she wanted this child and they went and they even bought little stuffed animals and and, and got a room and, and so on they, their belief was so their knowing was so strong that they weren't going to be uh, operating from any doubt whatsoever just eliminating all of the doubt and they sent me a picture of their three-month-old child uh, with him holding the baby. We've got a picture of it here. Um, these kinds of things. Another woman told me that she was living in Colorado and she had her house up for sale and she hadn't had someone look at it for two years. Not even look at it. And she started doing this meditation and within the next week she had four people look at it and she had an offer and then she sold her home by putting her attention on it. Now, so many of these stories... I have another one here, a letter from an attorney. And I got a letter from an attorney. Every time I get a letter from an attorney, I go, oh, boy, here we go. And uh, this man said, uh, you spoke to us on Sunday afternoon. On Sunday evening, I did both the morning and evening meditations again. Then on Monday morning, I did the prescribed routine. When I got to the office at 8.30, the phone started ringing. And he said earlier in the letter, he said, I've had very, very few calls into the office from prospective clients in the last three months and have not signed up any good cases at all in that time period but they said we'd been through a terrible drought and so on. He said, uh, even before my receptionist began answering the phone at 9 a.m., I had spoken with and scheduled an appointment for a new client. This week I've interviewed three new clients and accepted what I consider to be two good new cases. That's better than I've done in the past several years. And other people talk about quadrupling their income and all of these kinds of things. So it's, uh, it isn't just something that I am speaking about from uh, wishful thinking, if you will, or just hoping and then uh, having some lucky break sort of come along. What I'd like you to do now, listening to this program, each of you here, I'd like you to really think, if you knew, if you knew, which means an absence of doubt, if you, just like you know how to ride a bicycle or you know how to swim, and you know it, like if you know how to swim and someone throws you into a swimming pool, you are not going to drown. You know you can swim. And your nature just takes over. And you just swim out, out of it. If someone hands you a bicycle here, and you've been on it before, even though it's just two little wheels moving through space, if you knew that you could ride it, because you've had that direct experience of it, you wouldn't have any doubt. You would get on it. 
if you'd never been on one before, then you would have some doubt. So if you had a knowing based upon a direct experience that you had this capacity or this power or this ability, this talent, this unique quality of being able to manifest something for yourself in your life that you have perceived to be missing in your life, whether it's any of the things that I've just talked about in terms of abundance, overcoming scarcity, healing, whether it's a promotion, whether it's selling your home, whether it's having a child, whether it's creating a divine relationship, whether it's getting out of the one you're in, whether it's uh, attracting to you what it is that you would like to be able to attract, just by virtue of being able to use your inner world and have it then begin to show up. If you knew you had this, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. If you knew that, what would it be? And just sort of jot it down in your consciousness. What would that be? And even if it was a healing for somebody else, or even if it's a very, quote, unselfish, being able to uh, create uh, world peace, or being able to uh, affect a healing of someone close to you, or whatever. If you knew you had it, what would it be? And just put your attention on it. And later on, as we begin to practice this technique, I'd like you to begin to see and practice it for 15 days. In the morning and in the evening, as I prescribe later on in this program. And then just begin to look for the cues. Not demanding that it show up in the way that you think it should show up, because very likely it won't. It'll show up in a completely different way. It is taking your own divine self and beginning to have a knowing that is so powerful that you begin to practice certain principles that put you in touch with or align you with that spirit that creates and causes everything in the physical domain. And it's a very exciting kind of thing, particularly for me, because it gives me a real strong internal sense that we can literally manifest or create our own destiny and that destiny isn't something that's handed to us we're handed a free will and we're also given a divine connection to God and we have to stop our belief that somehow God and us are separate that God is something that's out there and not in here we've got to shift that and that will be the subject of the very first principle. Thank you.